Next up, we have um, terms from the Age of Steam and Steel. This is pretty much anything uh, from about the 1860s on to the modern era. Uh, and we're going to start with the aircraft carrier. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the weird weather here is screwing around with my, with my uh, sinuses, so you have to forgive me. The aircraft carrier was a warship that serves as basically a seagoing airfield uh, equipped with full-length flight deck and facilities for carrying, arming, fueling, launching, and recovering aircraft. Um, as usual, there's several different variants of this, so we're going to go through uh, those uh, as well. But anything that can carry aircraft uh, and operate them, like it has to be able to launch, recover, and service them. Uh can be considered an aircraft carrier. This first one isn't really its own term, as in it's not like an official term, but it's kind of has become adopted as an official term, sort of, by uh, uh, naval. Uh, fans and history buffs uh, and that's the supercarrier which is usually a nickname for the largest aircraft carriers uh, in a fleet usually uh, it's used in reference to American nuclear powered aircraft carriers um, like the Nimitz class uh, it can also refer to the more conventional steam powered ones like the Kitty Hawk and the Forrestal uh, and will often be uh, referred uh, we'll, that we use to refer to the largest carrier in a fleet. I've seen the uh, Taiho and Shinano called supercarriers as well. Um, in actuality, they are the fleet carriers of the uh, fleet, but supercarrier uh, tends to fit these larger ships better, in my opinion. Uh, speaking of fleet carriers, a uh, fleet carrier is an aircraft carrier designed to operate with the main fleet. Most of these were developed during World War II, um, and mm, I would say vast majority of aircraft carriers in service now, although considering the vast majority of aircraft carriers in service now are American, it would make sense, but most uh, aircraft carriers now are considered fleet carriers. Example of this uh, type of ship would be the USS Enterprise uh, CV-6. Moving down, we have the light carrier, which is an aircraft carrier that is smaller than your standard uh, fleet carriers for a Navy. Uh, usually they're cheaper to build or faster to build or offer some advantage uh, of the like. The Americans uh, use them uh, to get more flight decks uh, in, in into battle. Uh, example of one of those would be the USS Princeton. Moving uh, smaller still, we have the escort carrier, which is also called a baby flat top, a Woolworth carrier, or a Jeep carrier. And they tended to be small and slow carriers used by the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy, though they did see use in the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army uh, Air Force uh, during World War II. They're pretty much a product of World War II, really. You don't see them after, much after that. I mean, you do see them every now and then, but most of them are World War II vintage. They were typically about half the length and a third of the displacement of a fleet carrier and were slower carried fewer planes, were lighter armed and armored, and were usually built on commercial hulls, making them cheaper and quicker to build, allowing them to be used as, as a stopgap for a fleet carrier uh, or to escort convoy or work in anti-submarine warfare operations. Basically, wherever you needed something with an aircraft, but you didn't want to dedicate an Essex-class fleet carrier, there you go. Unlike light carriers, they really weren't capable of working with the main carrier fleet. Like the Princeton or rather the independence class, I guess would be a better way to say that. And even like really terrible light carriers like the Ryujo could still operate in a fleet. I mean, I wouldn't want to be operating the Ryujo in any kind of large carrier operation, but I know the Japanese did. Uh, escort carrier, you really can't 
do that with. It just doesn't have the facilities to operate in the main fleet. It's great in an uh, anti-submarine uh, warfare task force or a support force, kind of like Taffy 3, uh, the Battle of Samar. It's great for that kind of thing. Example of that would be like the USS St. Lowe or the USS Gambier Bay. The British developed what, uh, it's quite an interesting ship actually, uh, the Aircraft Maintenance Carrier, and the Royal Navy built these ships to basically act as a depot ship for its combat-oriented carriers, uh, kind of acting in a similar manner to the submarine and destroyer tenders, allowing aircraft to be transported and, and repaired uh, and sent back to active fleet carriers, example being HMS Unicorn. Take note, Azure Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorn should not be anywhere near a combat engagement. Uh, well, I guess in the one combat engagement they had in Azure Lane, where she was actually involved in it, I guess she didn't really have much choice. But do not send for all your Azure Lane players. Do not send Unicorn out there. <laughs> I don't play Azure Lane. I don't actually know if that's a good advice or not. But whatever. Next, we have another interesting uh, product of World War Two. And that's the Merchant Carrier, which is the immediate predecessor to the Escort Carrier. Uh, and these were limited purpose carriers operated un under uh, British and Dutch civilian registries during World War II. So, hey, there was a time where you could have a aircraft carrier, you could own an aircraft carrier as a civilian. Uh, they were adapted to this role by basically adding a flight deck to a bulk grain ship or an oil tanker or something big enough to allow planes to take off. And they tended to operate as anti-submarine uh, warfare ships uh, in convoys, so basically to fight off all the U-boats. An example of this would be the MV Rapana. Next we have something that I've kind of had to name myself because it's kind of just a weird situation. And that's an improvised carrier. Uh, during the Falklands War, the Royal Navy requisitioned container ships and would use them to transport aircraft to a combat zone. So it was kind of serving the same role as a depot ship or a tender, but it was moving aircraft into the combat zone and not necessarily meant to recover them. Example of this would be the Arctic Conveyor. Uh, next we have the Anti-Submarine Warfare Carrier, which is a small aircraft carrier, relatively. Uh, whose primary role is that of, like, it's it's the center or the nucleus or the the main force of an anti-submarine warfare hunter-killer group. A uh, good example of this would be USS Yorktown after uh, World War II, during the Cold War. And basically it carries either aircraft or helicopters. Very, it, it will sometimes, They'll sometimes carry fixed-wing aircraft, but it... It, unless the but by the time you get to the Cold War, there's not a lot of fixed wing aircraft really meant for that. But uh, see, remember now and then, usually they're rotary rotary wing aircraft that are used to uh, hunt and uh, hunt and kill enemy submarines. Um, moving on from there, uh, the helicopter carrier or helicopter destroyer is an aircraft carrier whose primary purpose is to operate helicopters, and usually. I mean, I guess they could, but usually they are not meant to have fixed-wing aircraft anywhere near them. Uh, example of this would be the JDS uh, Huga. Next, we have the amphibious warfare ship, which is a broad term for any amphibious vehicle uh, ship. Something designed to move troops or vehicles or be in some way involved in an amphibious invasion. And let's go through a few of those. We have the Amphibious Force Flagship, which is a special purpose uh, ship designed to command amphibious invasions. Uh, I think this is pretty much only a U.S. thing. Um, the Blue Ridge class is one that comes to mind there. An Attack Cargo Ship is a ship designed to carry troops, heavy equipment, and supplies in support of an amphibious assault and to provide naval gunfire support, I guess assuming that there's no destroyers or large capital ships were to do that. Uh, example of that would be the Andromeda class. The attack transport is a troop ship uh, adapted to transport invasion forces ashore. Uh, example would be the Harris class. High speed transport 
ships are converted destroyers or destroyer escorts used in amphibious operations and are meant to deliver small units like marine raiders and army rangers. An uh, example would be USS Manly. The LSD is an amphibious warfare ship with a well deck to launch landing craft and amphibious vehicles. An uh, example would be the Ivan Rogov class. LSM is an American uh, amphibious assault ship that I'm not really even sure if it, that even stands for anything specifically. Uh, or has uh, any discernible different role from other ships. An uh, example would be USS LSM-45. LST, or Landing Ship Tank, is a ship meant to support amphibious operations by carrying tanks, vehicles, cargo, and even troops, and landing them directly to the shore. An uh, example would be USS LST-325. The LHA is a general purpose helicopter carrying amphibious assault ship, and it's kind of a hybrid between the uh, uh, LSD and helicopter carrier. Uh, it's built with a full length flight deck and a well deck. Example would be the American Tarawa class. The LHD is a multi purpose amphibious assault ship with a flight deck and a well deck as well. Uh, example here would be the Mistral class. The LPD is a warship that embarks, transports, and lands elements of a landing force for expeditionary warfare missions. Uh, example would be the San Antonio class. You see a lot of these have the same role, and most of them are dependent on the era. So you're not always going to see all these uh, in service. At the same time, it depends on the era and the country. Uh, last one we're going to look at for amphibious ships is the LSI, which is an amphibious warfare ship meant to transport and land large numbers of infantry to the shore. example of this would be USS LSI... Uh, LCI, uh, LCI, LSI, I don't remember, uh, 713, uh, I'm probably gonna make a few of those mistakes, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> my, my bad. Next we have something that you don't actually see a lot in the U.S., and that's the Aviso. Uh, Avisos are a kind of dispatch boat meant to carry military dispatches. Example of this would be the Bougainville class. The battle cruiser is a type of capital ship usually characterized as having the armor of a cruiser and the main battery of a battleship. Its fleet role can, can vary depending on the country and era and the doctrine, but uh, usually it's a ship meant to hunt down enemy cruisers. Um, this would evolve usually to be placed in the battle line. An uh, example of this would be HMS Queen Mary. <clears throat> Next we have one that's distinctly German, and that's the Pocket Battleship, or Panzerschiff, which, uh, for those of you who speak German, that basically literally means armored ship. So, technically, I guess, all of these uh, battle line ships are Panzerschiffs, but uh, in, in the sense that it's usually used, it refers to a small capital ship, usually built like a heavy cruiser, but carrying larger than normal guns for a heavy cruiser, those being about 8 inches. Um, most Panzer shifts will be in the 11 inch range. I mean, the, the only ones ever built were German, but most of the ones designed will be of a similar era, I think. Uh, they're typically built by the Germans and mostly designed by the Germans and were used for commerce raiding. The only ones that were built were the Deutschland class. The super cruiser and Supercruiser and battle cruisers are very, very similar. Uh, the supercruiser actually fills the battle cruiser role, but in the 1930s. Um, but I am distinguishing them differently. Um, supercruisers were usually developed during the interwar periods, and typically they had the hull of a cruiser, but the guns that were bigger. Uh, more like a cruiser, a more cruiser-oriented panzer ship, almost. Uh, they were, their guns were usually heavier than cruiser armament uh, of a given country, but were smaller than the typical battleship armament of a country, uh, which is why I don't consider them to be battle cruisers. Uh, the Alaska class is an example of that. Uh, I don't consider the Alaska class to be a battle cruiser. I also don't consider the Alaska class to be a really, really big heavy cruiser, uh, because most American heavy cruisers, in fact, I think all American heavy gun cruisers were 8-inch gun cruisers. Uh, the Alaska carried 12-inch guns, so they were much bigger and thus vastly more capable than 
heavy cruiser guns uh, when fighting enemy cruisers. Um, and at a time, the 12 inch gun was battleship caliber, but at the time the Alaskas were designed and built, the U S Navy had pretty much moved on strictly to 14 inch guns. And at that point was basically building everything with 16 inch guns. So it wasn't really battleship caliber guns and the 12 inch guns while good, were not really good enough to stand up in a line of battle and actually damage an opponent, uh, that was conceivably they were going to be uh, fought at the time. So the Alaskas I consider to be super cruisers, uh, as in they are designed to do one very specific role, and that's hunt down cruisers. Uh, and they're not really meant to serve in a lot of battle. Of course, neither was the battle cruiser originally, so you know you never know what would happen there. But I digress. That gets real fun when you start looking at like the 1047s or the Scharnhorst, by the way, which don't really fit into any category. Uh, let's move on, though, uh, and start talking about battleships. And this is another one that evolves greatly. Uh, battleships tend to be large armored warships with main uh, battery of large caliber guns, um... And that's pretty much all it takes. Uh, the designs have evolved over the years. Uh, they're usually the center of naval forces of any country, and they pretty much are the... Well, I mean, they're called capital ships for a reason. They're the main capital ship in, in any... Actually, in every navy that could afford to build or buy them up until about mm, the early 1940s, once the aircraft carrier kind of starts establishing that, hey, it's very, very good at what it does, and what it does includes sinking battleships. So it got replaced by the aircraft carrier in, in that sense, but it usually was the center of the uh, fleet. There are a lot of different battleship designs, so we're going to go through uh, a few of them. Of course, the ship of the line is one, but it's a sailing ship and really isn't armored. Um, first off, though, we have the broadside ironclad, which is the logical progression from wooden ships of the line uh, that carried their weapons in a single line. Uh, across the, the ship on the broadside. Uh, they were usually steam and sail powered, but could just be steam powered. Uh, ships protected by iron or steel plates. And this was usually a laminate armor. Um, at least at the beginning, it would be a st uh, an iron plate backed up by teak wood or some equivalent, and then another plate. Uh, example of this would be HMS Warrior. Center battery ironclads were, the, were a further development of the broadside ironclad. Uh, that learned a lot fr uh, from the lessons of the Battle of Hampton Roads uh, in the American Civil War. Center battery ships um, allowed all their weapons to be held inside an armored citadel, and as a result, the ships could be made shorter and handier, and as a result, armor could be maximized without sacrificing firepower. Looks, however, were sacrificed. Example of one of these would be uh, HMS Alexandria. Next up is the Barbette Ironclad, which is an ironclad battleship with weapons mounted uh, in rotating open barbettes, or barbettes with gun shields, but aren't armored turrets. They work like an armored turret, and in fact, all you need to make a turret is put armor on them, but hey, <laughs> not, it, it, it sounds simple now, but someone had to come up with it. Example of this would be the Italia class. The turret ironclad is the exact same as the barbette ironclad, but with a fully armored gun house around the guns. An example of this would be HMS Inflexible. The pre-dreadnought battleship was not actually a term that existed until 1906. So, up until 1906, these were just called battleships. And these were battleships built between the late 1880s and uh, 1905 that replaced the ironclads. Uh, they were built uh, from steel protected by hardened steel armor and powered by triple expansion engines, carrying a heavy main gun uh, armament in armored turrets supported by secondary, tertiary, and if you're French, um, on down the line. Example of this would be IGN Mikasa. The dreadnought is the reason that the term pre-dreadnought exists, and... If there's one thing you that you absolutely have to remember when looking at naval uh, designs in the era 
before and during the World War periods, its HMS Dreadnought is very, very, very important. A Dreadnought battleship uh, is a battleship that was developed in the early 20th century that used an all-big gun armament, turbine engines, if it was good, <coughs> uh, and along with a few other improvements that made every other battleship built before HMS Dreadnought and a few afterwards obsolete. Entirely. Uh, the obvious example, of course, being HMS Dreadnought. Um, Drakenfell actually is an interesting thing where he will separate uh, Dreadnoughts into first and second generation Dreadnoughts and first and second generation Super Dreadnoughts. Speaking of Super Dreadnoughts, the Super Dreadnought is the next generation of Dreadnoughts, usually characterized by heavier, uh, by, uh, by the ship being heavier, faster, heavier armored, and heavier armed than previous generations. An example of this would be like the Orion or the New York class. A fast battleship is still a dreadnought, but it's a battleship with an emphasis on speed without any kind of undue compromise to either armor or armament, which would thus make it a battlecruiser. Uh, essentially, this is a battleship that has the speed of a battlecruiser, but can actually, you know, take a hit. And the argument, uh, uh, the jury's out, uh, rather, Jury's out on whether HMS Hood is a battlecruiser or a uh, fast battleship. I call it the battlecruiser, uh, personally. Um, fast battleships were... Well, they're the last hurrah of the battleship, really. Um, they weren't designed for carrier escort, but they were became very, very valuable escorts to aircraft carrier task forces, uh, purely because they were huge and you could put a whole metric-ass ton of guns on them. Uh, if you're American, of course. Uh, you look at American battleships of the uh, World War II era, and there is not a single place where there's not a, any aircraft gun mounted, and it's glorious because we in America like to make sure that every single sailor has a chance to exercise their Second Amendment rights in the face of the enemy. Um, they were also used for shore bombardment because, hey, 16-inch gun uh, is going to do a whole a lot of damage on land. Um, unfortunately, though, they were made obsolete, ultimately, by the carriers they were escorting. And as of 2020, I, I don't think there's any... There's no American battleships in commission. I don't think there's been any battleships in commission in any other country since the end of World War II. So, as of 2020, there is no battleship in active uh, service. Though there are several that are museums, so go check those out. Go support your local uh, museums. Here's one we've already seen, but hey, it has another definition here in the term of, the, of this era, and that is the Corvette, which in this sense is an easily built patrol and convoy escort vessel. By the way, fast battleship example, I forgot to mention, was the uh, Iowa class. The Corvette, who now, um, is a, a patrol and convoy escort vessel, uh, actually usually smaller than a destroyer escort, so small. Uh, example, let's be the flower class. There's another one we've already seen. The cutter is uh, usually used in law enforcement duties. That's a small ship similar to that of a frigate or a destroyer escort. Um, in fact, I think almost every single Coast Guard ship is called a Coast Guard cutter in America. Example of that would be the treasury class. The frigate, and here we are again in World War II was an anti-submarine vessel bigger than a corvette but smaller than a destroyer. In modern terms, they are used for any aircraft work. Uh, examples of this would be the Halifax or Oliver Hazard Perry class uh, in the modern sense and the Locke class in World War II. There's also the Armored Frigate, which is similar to an ironclad battleship and is what evolved into the Armored Cruiser and Protected Cruiser. Lots and lots of frigates. Best way to describe a frigate, in any sense, if you are ever trying to figure out if you're looking at a frigate, is a frigate is when you just don't give a damn anymore. You're welcome for that. Sloop of War, another one we've already seen before, is a small steam-powered warship not meant to be deployed for fleet uh, operations, and it's really a blanket term for a whole lot of different ships. An example of this would be Grim the Grimsby class. Here's another really blanket term, cruiser which is a term for many ships, usually a medium to large ship 
uh, in the World War periods and in the modern era, it's typically the largest uh, ship outside the aircraft carrier. Uh, there's a lot of variants of this, of course. Uh, first is the armored cruiser, which is designed to operate as long-range independent warships, capable of defeating anything apart from a battleship of the era, and fast enough to outrun any battleship, a proto-battlecruiser, if you will. In fact, the battlecruiser is the direct evolution of the armored cruiser. Uh, it has an armored deck and uh, an armored belt. Example of this would be the German Scharnhorst class. Uh, it's... Smaller cousin is the protected cruiser, which is a smaller ship than an armored cruiser, and uh, which armored cruisers could often be bigger than battleships. But it's smaller than an armored cruiser, and it's meant to take on smaller cruisers, uh, smaller cruisers, rather, and destroyers. The protected the protected cruiser has an uh, an armored deck to protect the vital machinery, but no belt uh, armor. <coughs> Example of this would be the Chilean. Uh, cruiser Esmeralda, and of course we have uh, we have the armored and protected cruiser. Well, there's also the unprotected cruiser, which is another type of cruiser uh, in the pre-dreadnought era, um, and uh, as the name implies, they don't even have the armored deck, though some would have a partial armored deck. Uh, like many terms, it was more a blanket term for anything that wasn't uh, an armored or protected cruiser. Lovely. Example of this would be the SMS Gefjan. The torpedo cruiser is a type of cruiser uh, armed primarily with torpedoes. Uh, the Japanese developed the most famous one of these. That would be the modified Kuma class uh, Kitakami. For all you Kantai collection fans out there, that is a, that was actually a real thing. It was in World of Warships, and it was super OP. I don't even think it's in the game anymore. Next up, we have the Scout Cruiser, which is kind of an evolution from and concurrent to the protected and unprotected cruiser, um, in the sense that it's in the same era, but it kind of combines aspects of both. Um, it was usually smaller and faster and more lightly armed than the protected or light cruisers, uh, it's, this is where terms start to run together. But it was larger than contemporary destroyers. In fact, I think it would be even larger than the destroyer leaders. Uh, they were intended for fleet scouting duties or for serving as destroyer flotilla leaders, uh, prior to destroyer leaders, of course. Uh, they often had six to ten destroyer caliber guns and carried torpedoes. For example, this would be the Chester class. The light cruiser, which is short for light armored cruiser, is a cruiser that carries armor in the same manner as an armored cruiser. These were lighter and smaller than armored cruisers, um, but they retained the uh, extended radius of action and self-sufficiency to operate around the world. They were ideal for convoy escort, uh, destroyer flotilla leaders, scouts, and fleet support, or AA support. In the World War II era, they were considered to be a cruiser armed with five or six inch guns, uh, at least according to the, most of the treaties. Example of this would be the Cleveland class. The heavy cruiser uh, was designed for long range and high speed uh, operations and was armed with guns of about 8 inches. Uh, most of these ships were designed, uh, designs were dictated by the Washington and London Naval Treaties. The heavy cruiser is kind of the best example of what happens when you use those treaties. Uh, example of that would be the Northampton class. The auxiliary cruiser was usually a converted armed merchantman used defensively as merchant raiders to disrupt trade. Example of this would be the KMS Cormoran. A dynamite cruiser, which has uh, nothing to do with dynamite, funnily enough, was a unique ship meant to, to use the dynamite compressed air guns. Uh, the only one ever built was USS Vesuvius. An anti-aircraft cruiser was a light cruiser variant armed with dual-purpose guns and designed to act as a floating anti-aircraft battery, usually for use in carrier task forces. The most famous example of this would be the Atlanta class. The guided missile cruiser is a modern cruiser armed with surface-to-air missiles and is the modern equivalent to the anti-aircraft cruiser. Most of these have kind of been replaced by guided missile destroyers, though. Uh, but the most famous example of this would be the American Ticonderoga. 
Aircraft cruisers are cruisers that combine the capability of an aircraft carrier with that of a cruiser uh, or a battleship. Uh, they're also known as aviation cruisers, cruiser carriers, or battle carriers. Um, yeah, I have many opinions on this, and I'm not going to go into them now. Uh, example of this would be HSWMS Gotland. There is a battleship equivalent of this, and I might actually have it later in the video, but I'll briefly touch on it now since we're here. Um, the battle carrier hybrid thing, the Issei is an example of that. It's essentially the same thing. It's a battleship with aircraft capabilities. Usually beyond that of normal battleships, i.e. it has a huge flight deck put on the back of it in, in, in the sense of the Issei class. Um, it usually is absolutely terrible. Don't ever do it. A destroyer is a fast, maneuverable, long endurance warship intended to escort larger vessels in a fleet, convoy, or battle group, and is meant to defend them against powerful short-range attackers. Uh, probably the best and most numerous example of this is the Fletcher class. Although I think there's actually more Clemsons built, but everyone knows the Fletcher class. And of course, there's many different versions of this. Um, you want to see the evolution of that? Drakenafell has a video on that. No, I don't know Drakenafell, by the way, but uh, I know he has videos on that because I watch his channel all the time. So, hey, Drak, if you happen to see this, that's like three shameless plugs for your channel, so. Great. I don't think you'll ever see this, but hey. If you do. Good for you. Uh, you're the inspiration for this channel. You and Space Doc. I also don't expect Space Doc will ever see this uh, video, but <laughs> whatever. Um, moving into the different story variants, the first one we're going to talk about is the Torpedo Boat, which is uh, a relatively small and fast ship meant to carry torpedoes into battle, uh, like the Hayabusa class. The Torpedo Gunboat is a form of gunboat armed with torpedoes and designed to hunt down and destroy smaller torpedo boats. Uh, so it's your counter to the torpedo boat. Uh, HMS Spider is an example. Torpedo Boat Destroyers are the evolution of the Torpedo Gunboat. They were larger and more heavily armed torpedo boats designed for the same mission as the Torpedo Gunboat, like the River class. A flotilla leader is a warship, usually a large destroyer or a small cruiser, meant to act as the flagship of a destroyer flotilla. Uh, not to be confused with the destroyer leader, which I'll get onto in a minute, although they can be used inter interchangeably. J.R.M. Dubrovnik is an example of this. <coughs> Excuse me. Destroyer leaders are a U.S. Navy designation for large destroyers built during the Cold War. But again, they can kind of be used interchangeably with the term flotilla leader because, hey, no one actually gives a shit. Example of one of these would be the Mitra class destroyer. Destroyer escorts, uh, in effect, is the U.S. Navy's classification of what would be a Corvette frigate or sloop of war in any other Navy. But specifically, they were ships designed with endurance... Uh, to escort convoys uh, of the Merchant Marine. USS Samuel B. Roberts comes to mind here. Last for the destroyers is the Guided Missile Destroyer, which is a destroyer meant to launch anti-aircraft missiles, serving a similar role to the anti-aircraft cruisers. Uh, the Arleigh Burke or the Congo are an example of that. Fast attack craft are small, fast, agile, and offensive warships armed with anti-ship missiles, guns, or torpedoes. Uh, a good example of that would be the Schnellboot. The gunboat is, again, a blanket term for smaller armed vessels classified as river gunboats, river monitors, coastal defense gunboats, or full-fledged monitors, and uh, the British flat iron gunboats, for example, would be the Ant class. We'll go into a few of those, but uh, these tend to fall into other terms, so, but, eh, we'll talk about a few of them. River gunboats are a type of gunboat adapted for river operations. The USS Penne is an example. The flat iron gunboat is a coastal gunboat with a low freeboard and no masts. Sounds similar to a monitor, but it's a flat iron gunboat. Uh, the end class, again, is your example of that. A coastal defense ship is a warship built for coastal defense of all things, mostly during the period from 1860 to 1920. They were small, often cruiser size, and sacrificed speed and range for armament. The, oh god, Finish. Vinamon. Not. Not. You know what? I'll just flash it on the screen. <laughs> that. That. That thing. The Kaikabon. Kaibokan. Ka, 
Again, it's on screen. It's a coastal defense ship used by the Japanese Navy during World War II and served roughly the same purpose as American destroyer escorts. The Eto Rofu class comes to mind there. A hospital ship is pretty self-explanatory, and it's a ship designated primarily to act as a floating medical treatment facility. The Mercy class comes to mind. By the way, it takes more than a locomotive to sink one of those. Assuming, of course, you can get the locomotive anywhere near it. Too soon? Yeah. Landing craft are small uh, to medium seagoing craft used to transport landing forces to shore during an amphibious invasion. You thought we were done with, with all the amphibious ships, didn't you? <laughs> Prove you wrong. Next, we have the littoral combat ship, or the literal combat ship. But literal combat ship sounds like you're trying to make a, either a bad pun or a meme. So I go with littoral. Uh, and it's a U.S. designation for ships meant to operate near the shore. And yes, destroyers do have this capability. And yes, there is a difference. <laughs> what is that difference? They were designed to do it. <laughs> Assault gun? Tank destroyer. Example of this would be the Independence class. And if those look familiar, hey, hey, you're a fan of Cars 2. The Mine Planter, uh, or Torpedo Planter, uh, were used uh, in mine warfare in the early days of World War I. They were designed to install controlled mines or contact mines uh, in coastal fortifications. Don't have a specific example of that one for you. Uh, and I frankly don't feel like going to look one up. It's 3 a.m. and I don't really care. So, sorry. Mine sweepers are a warship meant to counter the threat of naval mines and clear waterways of said explosives. There you go. The uh, Admirable class is an example of that. Not to be confused with the Mine Hunter, which is a ship that seeks, detects, and destroys individual mines, like the Osprey class. A Mine Countermeasure ship, which apparently is different from the last two, is a ship meant to locate and destroy naval mines. This is another example of the timing of uh, the ship when the ship is built. Is the example is the uh, thing there. Anyway, it combines the role of a mine sweeper and a mine hunter, uh, hunt class for uh, example of that. A mine layer is a ship meant to destroy or lay mines. HMS, uh, excuse me, HMCS Sencati. For example, that a missile boat is a fast warship armed with anti-ship missiles like the OSA class. Monitors are a fun and weird one. Uh, they're a relatively small warship that lacks speed and armor, but carries disproportionately large guns used in coast defense and shore bombardment. They tend to have a really, really, really low freeboard, a really, really shallow draft, and some ridiculous torpedo bulges in the World War period. Um, and they tend to be the most meme-worthy ships of all time ever. Uh, they get their name from the example that I'm using here, USS Monitor. And there's a few different versions of that, but... Eh, differences of that really don't have any specific terms for the exception of one but uh, more, the differences there are more evolutionary than they are anything else river monitors uh, are usually the largest riverine vessels uh, essentially it's a monitor meant to operate in riverine environments the Parna Parnaiba Parnabia part I'm, so I'm sorry again a patrol boat is a small ship generally designed for coast defense duties and operated by the Navy, Coast Guard, Police, or Customs Forces. Um, one of the most interesting ones of these would be the ones built by uh, the Damon Stan line, uh, specifically the 4207 or the 5009. Uh, a Q ship is a heavily armed merchant with concealed weaponry designed to lure subs into making a surface attack and allowing them to open fire on them. Uh, USS Gold Star. Uh, example of that. Um, we're going to talk about the various different versions of this, but I'm going to give you a brief rundown of what this is. Tenders and depot ships. These are vessels designed to service other vessels. Uh, as mentioned, the maintenance aircraft carrier is kind of an aircraft carrier tender, if you will. Destroyer tenders are auxiliary ships designed to provide maintenance to uh, a destroyer flotilla or other small ships that may need various things for repair or resupply. The Klondike class, as an example of this, submarine tenders are pretty much the exact same thing, but for submarines. The Emery S. Land class, 
uh, as an example. A seaplane tender is a boat or a ship that supports operations of seaplanes. Um, you get to, you know, the, these can be anything from destroyers that are uh, supporting them to purpose-built ships. The Faldra or Langley. A submarine is another blanket term, and it's basically any craft capable of operations underwater. A fleet sub is a submarine with the speed, range, and endurance to operate as part of a Navy's battle fleet. The Americans like this. They built the Gato class. The submarine aircraft carrier is um, good in theory, hard to do in any kind of practical sense. Um, it's a submarine equipped with aircraft for observation or attack. It is possible, and it has been done done right, but the most famous example is probably also the biggest failure of it, and that's the I-400. Although, to be fair, the I-400 worked, except the mission it was designed for was completely bonkers. Not as bonkers as the America bomber, but right up there. Uh, the ballistic missile sub uh, is a submarine capable of deploying submarine-launched uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads. Uh, the Delta or the Typhoon uh, or, or the Ohio are examples of this. A hunter-killer sub, also called an attack sub, uh, are specifically uh, designed for the purpose of attacking and sinking other subs, uh, any service combatants or merchants. Um, this is usually a modern term uh, because during the World War periods, you pretty much just had submarines and they would often if they were attacking a merchant ship, would just surface and shoot it. But uh, with submarine technology getting better, you can get away with uh, being submerged a lot more often. And you get awesome submarine dogfights. And uh, one of my personal favorites of this is the Sea Wolf. Next, you have the Sub Cruiser, which, unlike the Sub Aircraft Carrier, is just completely bonkers in general. And it's a large sub designed to remain at sea for extended periods. Okay. We're okay with that so far. Uh, an area is distance, uh, uh, distant from bases. Yeah, makes sense. That's all right. That's not bad. The best example of this one is the Sarkouf. And, uh... uh where, do you, where do I begin? There's going to be a whole video on that. I'm, uh, I'll tell you that right now. Let's just uh, start with the 8-inch gun turret. Bad idea. And no, there's no tor no torpedo tubes in the front. They are carried like a destroyer's torpedo tubes. And I quit. <clears throat> the Sub Chaser is a small and fast uh, vessel that's intended for anti-submarine warfare. The PC-461 uh, class. It's pretty self-explanatory what it does. Uh, a Naval Auxiliary is a shipment to operate in one or more of many support roles for Navy operations. There are... Almost as many of these as there are, are like the, like literally, there's some some of these things where there's only one ship built for it, but hey, it's its own term because it can do a thing. But here's a few of the more common and more famous ones. Uh, fleet Oiler is an auxiliary with fuel tanks and dry cargo holds, which can supply fuel and dry stores to combat ships, like the Cimarron. Uh, ammunition ships are auxiliary ships designed to carry ammo to resupply combat ships, like the Mount Hood class. Repair ships are designed to maintenance and repair ships. Uh, USS Vestal, most famous, that, famous example of that one. Uh, and troop ships are a shipment to carry soldiers in either peacetime or wartime. Uh, example of that would be the Marine Adder class. 